I speak to you in the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Well, the good news I want to proclaim this morning is that God cares more about the things that concern us than we do. God cares more about the things that concern us than we do. And if we can get to the place of believing this, we can be free from grasping for blessings and free to live with hands open to whatever blessings God wants to give. So God cares more about the things that concern us than we do. In one sense, I don't have to tell any of you this, because as I recounted last Sunday, we've all just gotten to experience it firsthand with the building situation, where God clearly cared about our need for a future home and had a plan, which just took many years to unfold, sometimes happens. But now let's take this good news beyond the church building situation. Consider its implications for the concern that we carry that remain unresolved, that we carry corporately or also individually. I want to invite you to consider for a moment what concerns you carry. What concerns do you carry with you? What keeps you up at night? What do you find yourself praying about? What do you find yourself worrying about? Perhaps there's someone you care deeply about, a friend, a spouse, a son or daughter, a sibling that you're concerned about. Perhaps you desire to be the friend or spouse or parent or sibling that they need and you're not always sure how. And it weighs on you. Perhaps your concern is relational, but it's for yourself that you desire to have friendship at a level of depth and vulnerability that you don't currently enjoy. I would imagine most of us can identify with some sort of relational concern like I've just described. And yet for most of us, the concerns we carry are not singular, right? We carry around more than one. and They're not isolated to just relational matters. We may find ourselves concerned about fulfilling our responsibilities at our job. Or in the home, we may find ourselves concerned about finances. We may feel concerned about our walk with God, whether we're really growing, however you evaluate that, whether we're giving enough attention to our relationship to God, whether we're loving God and our neighbor well. Lent, in particular, can raise that concern in ways that may or may not be encouraging. How are we doing at seeking his kingdom, both individually and as a parish? What are we doing to contribute to the kingdom of God? Are we doing enough? Even that can be a concern. But the good news is that God cares more about all of these concerns I've just listed. Cares more about them than we do. And trusting this frees us to take up a posture of living before him with open hands and relaxing Relaxing in our assurance of his love. During this Lent, we've been talking through some of uh, the Gravity Leaderships Academy's axioms. The first one we talked about is that God is like Jesus, and there is nothing about God that is unlike Jesus, which I think we were all pretty challenged by. I know I am. Then a second axiom was that God doesn't meet us where we should be, or where we'd like to be, he meets us right where we really are. That's some good news. God meets us in our reality. Well, the next one I want to consider today is that God cares more about it than we do. And the first it that God cares about that I want to talk about is our spiritual lives and growth. And then we'll talk about how this principle applies to some of the other types of concerns that may have come up for us that we may carry. 
So first, God cares more about our spiritual growth and maturity than we do. For many of, this, for many of us, this is good news, big time. Because for many of us, our spiritual lives cause us to feel a sort of constant pressure. So you might feel that in your spiritual life as a Christian, kind of a constant pressure, even anxiety, pressure to perform morally, pressure to love God and neighbor perfectly, pressure to be the godly dad or mom our kids need or the godly grandmother or grandfather or grandkids need. Particularly if we're folks who tend toward living with that demanding judge image of God or the deterministic micromanager image of God that we've talked about, our spiritual lives are likely to feel like a constant burden, unfortunately. Where we feel like we aren't doing enough good stuff or we're doing too much bad stuff or both. So that rather than Christianity being an invitation to a life where we find Jesus' yoke to be easy, we may live with a sense instead that God is watching how we live and always being sort of frustrated with how we're performing. And so our spiritual posture has become one of if that's the case, become one of trying to take control and perform for God to be a good Christian in our own strength. Probably pretty exhausted, if that's the case. Maybe we're in a phase where we're failing to do that, though. We've kind of given up because we're so exhausted with that brand of a spiritual life. And so we've given up, and we're sort of just living in shame about it shooting on ourselves. I shouldn't have said that. I know I should be better. I know I should get to church, all this kind of stuff. But usually when we should on ourselves like that, it's between us and it's between us and ourselves. Often we don't loop God in. Often it's kind of this inner dialogue that we have. So that actually in that process we're keeping God's at arms God at arms length. We're not relying on him. We're living as if our spiritual growth and transformation is all up to us. But this is not the picture of the spiritual life that's revealed to us in the Bible. Rather than a picture of God as a dissatisfied supervisor. You ever feel that way? God is my dissatisfied supervisor. Rather than that, in Scripture we see Jesus expressing how he longs to gather us under his wings like a hen gathers her chicks. We read the words of Christ beckoning us who are weary and burdened to come to him so he can give us rest. In Scripture he promises, Jesus promises to give us his Holy Spirit to impart to us his peace that we would not be troubled or afraid. We're told that Jesus is even now seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding on our behalf. And Jesus promised that it is the Father's good pleasure to give us the kingdom. This is not a picture of a dissatisfied supervisor. This is the picture of a loving and inviting God that we see revealed to us in Christ. The good news is that God cares about our growth into Christ's likeness more than we do. <sighs> Thank goodness. So we can relinqu relinquish any impulse to take on that project alone. And instead we can partner with him, cooperate with where he's leading us in his plan, instead of having to figure out how to gussy ourselves up better on our own. This partnership that I'm describing is the way Jesus lived in his earthly life in relationship with the Father. In this morning's passage from John chapter 5, Jesus said in verse 19, he said, Very truly I tell you, the Son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his Father doing. Because whatever the Father does, the Son also does. And in just a few minutes, I'm going to talk about what it could look like for us to live this way, relaxing in God's love and discerning what he is doing so that we can cooperate with, us, with it. And it's not all on our shoulders. 
Now, before we get to that, though, there may be some for whom what I've said so far doesn't actually resonate, right? Some of us aren't living with a ton of anxiety about our spiritual lives. Some of us don't feel like we're trying to take our spiritual growth into our own hands because spiritual growth has never exactly been a goal that we're interested in. This is more likely to be the case for those who tend to live with either the distant deity image of God or the doting grandfather image of God, right? Particularly lifelong Anglicans or Episcopalians may tend to err in this direction, right? Being grateful for God's forgiveness and love, but never really having a sense that God is up to something like actively working in our lives to change our character to be more like Jesus, what are we talking about? Change me? I don't want to change. So in this direction, the error might be in not believing God is too concerned with us at all. And yet this also diverges from the picture of God that Scripture reveals. As a God who has plans for every single one of us. From Ephesians 2 today, the final verse we read, we heard Paul say in verse 10, Quote, we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. But even if we do struggle in this way with being passive in our faith, we might call it, you know, passive beyond perhaps attending church on occasion. Even if that's the case, once again, the good news is that God cares more about it than we do. God cares more about it than we do. So if, if we can acknowledge we've been passive toward God rather than partnering with him, this is, is how we can begin to give him room to build in us a desire to live closer to him. Maybe we don't have a desire to live closer to God. We can admit that to him and say, I hear that this is what you say in scripture. I've never really felt close to you. I've never really felt like you care in particular about me or have a particular plan for me. And so I don't really, I've kind of shut that part of me down. Be honest with him about that. Let him build that desire. You don't have to conjure it up. So when it comes to our spiritual growth, the struggle for us may be that we can take too much responsibility for it ourselves or that we've sort of allowed our hearts to harden to the invitation from God to partner with him at all. But the good news is that God not only cares more about our spiritual journey of transformation than we do, but God also cares about all of the other concerns we list at the beginning more than we do as well. We mentioned concerns, I mentioned concerns about people we care about. All right, maybe God brought something to mind there, which may be a concern for their spiritual lives or some material need they have. We talked about our own desires for relationships or in our relationships. We talked about work concerns, financial concerns, those sorts of things. I don't know what concern or concerns have been brought to mind for you, but what I can tell you is that as much as you care about those things, about that thing, as much as you may care, and you may care very deeply, God cares about it more. God cares about it even more than you do. And trusting that freeze can free us from grasping for blessings and trying to fix it all ourselves to living with hands open to whatever blessings he wants to impart, how he is looking to move in that situation. So what does that look like practically? What does it look like to live with our hands open instead of grasping for blessings? Well, number one, I would suggest we should never be shy to express the concerns or desires that we have to God in prayer. First Peter 5 says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Philippians 4 says, do not be anxious about anything, but, every, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. If we aren't inclined to share the deepest concerns or desires that we have, if we aren't inclined to share those with God, 
this is probably a sign that either we don't really believe God cares more than we do, or that in our self-willfulness, we just prefer not to have God weigh in, right? Because we don't trust his way as best. We've come to believe that it is on us to secure blessings in our life, that God doesn't really have our back. And so we've, we've learned to grasp for them ourselves if we want to enjoy goodness in this life. Our passage from Genesis this morning was just one episode from the storied life of Jacob. It is indeed a storied life. I think we spent about eight weeks on it a few years ago. Jacob the narcissist. Um, you all remember that one? It's true. Jacob's name literally meant grasper. One who grasped another by the heel. And this was an apt name for Jacob because Jacob spent most all of his life grasping for blessings himself, taking whatever he could, to, whatever he could get to essentially try to bless himself instead of receiving the blessings God wanted to give him. Right? He tried to get his brother's birthright. He tried to get a wife, and he screwed that up, so he had to get another one, right? Um, the result, though, of Jacob's lifestyle of trying to grasp blessing for himself was that he left mess after mess in his wake, and he was never at peace. He couldn't even appreciate all the blessings God did bestow upon him, right? God was trying to bless him like every other chapter, right? Every other chapter is like one chapter he's trying to take something for himself. The next chapter, God's trying to bless him, and he can't even like tune into it because he's just so consumed with, I got I to gotta get mine, Right? So like Jacob, we can tend to live like Jacob, trying to grasp blessing for ourselves. And, and I think a sign of that is when we aren't willing to run our major life decisions by both God and by another trusted believer who's not in our family. Right? If we don't have that practice, that's a sign that we may not really want God to weigh in on the situation. Right? We just want him to co-sign on whatever we want to do. Right? And I don't say that to condemn us. I get it. I do it. But I do know that that is the path of death and brokenness and not the path of, that God calls us to follow him. Right? Otherwise, it can manifest with concerns we carry is when we, you know, when we have loved ones who don't know Jesus and we try to nag them into the kingdom, Right? Or we want relational intimacy and we try to nag that person into it. Maybe we even want to serve God in some significant way, but we don't give space for discernment about how he would have us serve him. We're, we're driving that train and come hell or high water, we're going to serve him the way we've decided and fulfill the vision that's come up in our minds. But in the opposite direction, the more passive extreme, is we might instead take on a posture where we pray about our concerns to God but then kind of in an extreme way, surrender any responsibility or expectation that we may have a part to play in the situation for God to move forward. This can be the unfortunate fruit of the oft-quoted maxim, let go and let God. I hate to tell you that's not exactly in the Bible. Um, used a lot, right? Let go and let God. Now, I get it. Like, there's, a, there's some good in there, right? <laughs> The problem, right, it, at least let go, let God involves God some. The problem is it kind of doesn't imply partnership with God. Instead, it implies this hyper-sovereign image of God of like, I'm just going to shut down here, God. I'm going to let go and let God. You got this. As if God is just this God who zaps people in situations when he darn well gets ready, and we're just going to wait it out until he does. All right? It doesn't leave open the possibility that maybe, maybe there's something he wants me to do in this. Or maybe I'm the problem in the situation, that he wants to change something there. So that's why I would say much, suggest much better than the posture of let go and let God is the posture expressed by the serenity prayer. Some of us may be familiar with that, right? Where we pray, we pray, God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I can't change, but to change the things that I can 
and give me the wisdom to know the difference between those two. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, that I'm a limited human being. I can't, I, there's a limit to my authority. There's a limit to my control, right? But also help me to change the things I can to be an active agent here and help me to know the difference, right? See how that differs from let go and let God? Pretty significantly, actually. Right? The serenity prayer surrenders to God what's not under our authority or control, but it's also open to him revealing what we can do to contribute positive, positively to any given situation. Right? We're partners with him. So the good news is that God cares more about the things that concern us than we do. And if we can begin to believe this, our hearts can begin to grasp this. We can then be free from grasping for blessings, spending our life grasping for blessings in our own strength and supposed wisdom, and instead live with hands open to whatever blessings God wants to give. And he's such a good giver. Right? He's so much better at it than we do. He knows what we need so much more than we know. In other words, living with open hands before God means that we are open to him leading us to play a part but, and here's the part I haven't said yet, that we leave all outcomes to God. We leave the outcomes to him. Maybe, I, maybe this is what you want me to do, but it could turn out this way, it could turn out that way, right? We aren't dictating outcomes to God. We aren't living with expectations upon him so that when granny, we pray for granny not to die, she does die, and then we resent God about it, right? Because that's not how God works. Nobody said he works that way. We come up with that. So finally, I want to talk for just a moment about how we discern what God is up to, right? If Jesus only did what he saw the Father doing, how did Jesus discern that? How do we discern that? You say, well, Jesus, I mean, he's Jesus, you know, he's God. Well, well when Jesus came to earth, he limited himself to walk in the shoes that we have to walk in, right? He had to live before God the way we do. How do we discern what the Father is doing? If God's always active and at work and he cares about things more than we do, how can we become active participants in what he's up to without taking over or running ahead of him? Well, the Gravity Guys, Matt Tebby and Ben Sternke, they suggest, they suggest one way we go about this is we go about life paying attention to nudges. Nudges that could be from God. Now, I hesitate to define such a nudge, what exactly that's like. We're all different temperaments, right? And God works with all of us in different ways. But here, I'll try. A nudge can be a thought that, we've, that we have that we get excited about, right? It could be a new desire that we're able to kind of articulate and speak and identify, it could be an idea that somebody else shares that we get excited about. It could be a vision for how a problem might be solved or for how a need might be met. Matt and Ben's encouragement is to trust that God is at work in nudges. But, this is important, believing that God is at work in nudges doesn't mean that any particular nudge is from God or not, right? The nudge may be the burrito I ate, right? So, so what do we do then? All right, I'm open to nudges. Great, okay. We need to test them. And the way we test whether a nudge is from God, or whether, it's, whether it is or, or not, is first by opening ourselves to the feedback of others. And second, by looking for grace. Right? Opening ourselves to the feedback of others, I've kind of already talked about that here. Do we have another believer, at least, who's not in our family, right? There can be a lot of bias there if they're in our family. All right, honey, you think I should do this? Yes, I do. Okay, well, of course she thinks I should buy her a new car. Um, <laughs> actually, Amanda would never say that. Um, so open ourselves to feedback from others instead of this God who may or may not speak back to us, right? The Holy Spirit's and other people. God gave us the church for a reason. Second, I said, Look for grace. And this is a hard one to explain, so 
Roll with me here. What is meant by grace? It, is there some way God's presence seems to maybe be at work here? I get that that's subjective. Um, it can be trauma. But you know what? The good thing about subjective stuff is that there is still grace of forgiveness towards us if we screw this up, right? So sometimes it takes some risk, some experimentation. Is there some way God's presence seems to be at work? It, is there something in this direction that seems to have the fragrance of God? And one, and one way we may be able to tell that, is this going to benefit people other than me? <laughs> right? If it's going to benefit me and just glorify me, hmm, might not be God. Right? Could be, but might not be. Right? Then third, once we kind of say, well, maybe this is, yeah, maybe. See if there is a discernible next step you can take and be faithful at without having to have the whole strategy, the whole plan, every step of the way, right? God does not usually lay out the next 20 steps. I don't know if y'all have noticed, right? He doesn't work that way. Now we want to have the next 20 steps, but, or we may. Right. So often our flesh wants to be all in or all out. Either we want to be able to see how the whole plan would work before taking any step or risk at all, or in our self-willfulness, we try to devise a whole strategy and just ram the whole plan through, right? But instead, and God may need to teach us some divine patience here, if we can just discern a next step that we can faithfully take in a situation, once we've taken that step, we will actually be in a different place than we were before we took it. We will have a different perspective. We may have new information, right? And we can then reevaluate if God wants us to keep moving with another step or if actually it's a closed door, right? And we may keep doing that. We may do five steps like that. And then at the fifth step, it's a closed door, right? We got to be open to either the whole way, because we want God's will, not just to force our own will, right? I was so proud, honestly, so proud that this is how the vestry and property search committee approached the building situation. I mean, over years, right? But they trusted God had our best interests in mind, that he had a plan for us, but we didn't know the whole plan. We didn't have the whole picture. We expressed our desire to him to keep this building. And we kept, in the past year, past six months, kept seeing the next step we could actually take before that, right? We paid attention to his prompting to, to finally move on it. And we kept seeing a next step. We found others who were brought into the conversation for whatever, whatever reason, whether it's a realtor or an attorney somehow, by God's grace, right? Who were able to affirm, oh, we're on the right track here. But at any point, the doors could have all been closed. His will for us may have been something else. And that might have been sad. It would have been sad. But it still would have been best. Right? Because we still would have been right where God wanted us. Which is the only place we want to be. Far better to be walking with God and get an outcome that's different from what we hope for than to force the outcome we think is best to realize we left God in the dust many steps back. So to close this morning, I want to close with a prayer by leading us just in a short time of prayer. I want to give us the opportunity to bring any concerns weighing on us before the Lord and ask him to show us what he's doing. We might line up with it. So would you bow your heads and pray with me? This time I want to invite you to give thanks to God that he cares more about our concerns, more about your concerns than even you do. Can you thank him for that? if you want, if your heart's there. And now I want to give us a moment to just name a concern, maybe two, before him in the quiet of our hearts.
whether it's a kind of concern for ourself or someone we love, whether it's a material concern, a spiritual concern. Thank you, God, that you care about that. Now would you ask him to show you if there's any, any action you should take? Maybe there isn't. Maybe right now the answer is just to pray. Maybe the answer is just to wait. If there is any action, is there someone that comes to mind? Is there somebody you can be accountable to about that? To be sure this is something God's grace is in, to guard against self-willfulness. Now ask him if there's anything he wants to show you that he's up to in or through your life that is his concern that he wants you to know about, that he wants you to partner with him on. Now, finally, if, if he's shown you anything, give him thanks for that. But if not, don't be discouraged. Right? He speaks to different people in different ways. Just set your mind to keep turning back to him with your concerns again and again, and he'll be faithful to guide you into the path of righteousness the way that only he knows how. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.